welcome to the show. I'm super excited to have Katie Forsyth on and to talk about entrepreneurship and leadership and um, mental fitness. And Katie's the co-founder of Friendly Composting up in Kamloops, BC. Welcome to the show, Katie. And um, just for everybody listening, can you give like a really quick um, share about like what your composting business is and how that kind of came about? Yeah, definitely. Um, So we are a weekly compost collection service um, with local product delivery. So we founded in March 2020, right around the time that the pandemic hit BC. Um, I was transitioning out of a a job and a role that didn't suit me and uh, came into friendly composting. So we um, basically offer weekly collection of organic food waste um, and we're offering a solution and filling a gap for our community because we don't have a municipal or city run program. Um, And then we also partner with local food producers and farmers uh, to bring local uh, food to people's door every week. That's awesome. A lot more community minded, local support. Um, And I love the, yeah, like circular part of how it's all localized with composting and food production and then kind of comes full circle for everybody in Kamloops. Um, So I want to start off just by like hearing your story into entrepreneurship because I think some of that backstory is a really important part of how you probably got to where you are today. Um, So how did you first get into entrepreneurship? Yeah, so it wasn't something that I planned. Um, I went into my undergrad planning to become a school teacher. That's what my mom did. Um, And in my fourth year, I, or my third year, I got connected through a job fair with College Pro Painters. Um, So I came up through the College Pro program. I did that for two years. Um, And it really planted a seed for me, um, just in terms of being my own boss and putting my own team together. And um, I got really kind of like hooked on that sales process and those connections to more people in in a community. Um, So yeah, I did that for two years. I ended up, um, I'm almost done my, my undergrad actually. I ended up pulling out of it because I did kind of like find this new inspiration and thought I could maybe run with that for a little bit. Um, But the plan is to still finish the education degree just so I have it. (laughs) But I was about four and a half years into it. and yeah, I just caught a bug for, for business. And it really was not something I planned or studied or had major like influences in my life with. Um, it was just something that happened very organically for me. Yeah. Great. Mm-hmm. And so what, like, if you were to try and get specific, like what was it about entrepreneurship that was, that kind of reeled you in? Is there, was there any one thing? I think for a long time in most of my jobs growing up, I always wanted to take more of a a higher role. Like no matter what I was learning, I just like wanted to learn the next thing and the next thing. And I wanted to like move up really fast through different industries, through the restaurant industry. I grew up working on a berry farm. I started scooping ice cream there and I wanted to like get into the the main stand. Then I wanted to be in the field with the pickers. Then I wanted to like be driving the trucks. Like I just always had to learn the next thing and everything I did. Um, So as soon as I got into college pro, I felt it. I was like, I get to do it all. I get to plan it all. I get to put people in positions. I get to make the connections with the clients. I get to book the job and take the deposits and write the checks for payroll. Like it just was like so addicting to get to just learn how to do everything um, within kind of like a structure where it was able to like, I was able to mimic kind of people that had done it before me. And I had coaches that were, you know, checking in on my progress. So I was kind of getting that like stamp of approval and pat on the back every week. And, um, so yeah, it just, it just kind of like snowballed from there. It was just really addicting to just keep learning that new skill. I didn't, I mean, we, I went into it having known nothing about painting. So like that was a new skill right away. And then I, all of a sudden the next week had to train painters how to paint. So it was like, I loved that. I loved that challenge. Mm-hmm. It was so challenging. <laughs> well, and what's what I always love when I chat with entrepreneurs or founders is they enjoy that because there's a lot of people that really shy away from diving into something where there's so much uncertainty and having to figure out all these things like payroll and all that kind of stuff for a lot of people that'd be totally overwhelming. Um, 
when you look back at that time in college pro, which I don't know if you knew this, but actually today is like a 50 year anniversary of college oh, pro. No <laughs> um, I didn't know that. So I should, I'll send you the link. I, okay. There's a, like a video webinar later today for college pro for 50 years. So alumni uh, for all the alumni. So I'll make sure I send you that. And for all of you college <laughs> pro alumni listening, hopefully you're, you're attending this um, comp, our little video conference <laughs> because so many entrepreneurs have gone through the college pro track. Um, there's so many businesses that have been built from entrepreneurs that got their start there. I'm one as well. That's how Katie and I met. And I'm sure I'm going to have more on the show later down the road. Um, but go like just segueing back into college pro, like what was like when you look back at that time, how did like what was the biggest shift that you had yourself in um, going through that experience? Like, what was the biggest change that you had? Hmm. I think from the biggest change I had coming out of that or going through it, I guess, was just, um, just kind of like a belief in, in myself for sure. I feel like I, I, like I grew up through like really competitive athletics and like everything like that, but it was always in team sport. And I, that was something I was doing like mostly by myself, obviously I build a team, but like being an entrepreneur is a very, it can be a very like lonely place. You're working a lot alone to move things forward. And when you're not getting a pat on the back from a teammate or someone else, like you still have to move forward and plug through it. Um, so it did kind of like took me, take me on a bit of a roller coaster in terms of highs and lows that I felt. Um, and which was a huge polar opposite from the way I was feeling coming out of like my competitive athletics, where I, I didn't feel those same lows and that same loneliness um, but still wanted to achieve something so great. <laughs> so there was like, it definitely kind of knocked me on my ass for a bit. Like I, it really was humbling. Cause I was like, this is something that I'm really challenged that's challenging me and like who I am. Um, and it totally changed my identity and like where I pictured my life, which we'll definitely get into, but finding my way back to being an entrepreneur was like a really hard chapter. Like I did have to coming out of college pro and taking on just regular jobs again, I really struggled. Like I was like, I want to feel that same sort of like passion and drive and challenge, but I'm not finding it. And then, so it was like probably about five or six years before I, I came back and, and are, have now, you know, found a friendly composting and found my way back to that. But um, it really changed how I thought my life was going to go. I just kind of thought I was going to finish my volleyball career at SFU and become a teacher. And that was what I was going to do. And then it was just like, it kind of hit me out of nowhere and I got really hooked and I've just been trying to find my way back. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and I'd love to hear a little bit more about your, that in between period and then, yeah. How you found your way back? Like what was that defining moment? So after college pro, mm -hmm. um, where did you go? What was that like? Yeah. So I ran the college pro franchise in the lower mainland. I was going to school at SFU in Burnaby um, came up to Kamloops and got a job in nonprofit. So I worked for the Heart and Stroke Foundation for um, nearly three years and ran about half a million dollars in fundraising for um, their school programs and their, their canvassing campaign every February. Um, so I coordinated about 1,200 volunteers at Heart and Stroke um, and about 65 uh, schools that I toured around to teaching kids about heart health and advocacy and uh, physical um, fitness and just kind of like the warning signs of stroke and heart attack. And that was something that was really connected to, to, um, me personally, I did lose my dad to heart disease quite young. Um, so it was like this shift where I was going into something that again, just like it meant a lot more to me than painting. Um, but really it was still a challenge. It just ultimately was just took so much out of me. Um, and I think coming off of that high of college pro where you're like constantly getting that pat on the back, there's a lot more in nonprofit that's a little bit like thankless. Um, and you don't necessarily always get that. You're just constantly asking and asking and pouring yourself out there and trying to make people connect to it. So there's like an emotional component. And so it was like, I felt that by year three, I was going, not only 
you know, am I responsible for about half a million dollars in business? Like obviously it's nonprofit and fundraising, but I'm coordinating all of that money coming in for, you know, 18 bucks an hour. <laughs> like I was just like, there was no, there was such a ceiling and a cap to like what I was making. And so I was just pouring so much of myself into it and it felt good, but it wasn't, it wasn't helping move me along. Mm -hmm. Um, so I did ultimately come out of that. I got back into the restaurant industry and same thing I started and I just like had to work my way right to the top. So I ended up taking on a full-time management role with like the busiest restaurant in town. Um, just to kind of like slow, just like get to get out of my own head. Um, it was just such an emotional place and, um, having all those, all those conversations and hearing the story. So yeah, getting back to something simpler where I knew I could just make a lot of cash and like get myself just like back on track financially. Um, and then it just took a lot out of me again, in terms of like a nightlife and like the social pressures of like just that environment and how fast paced and everything it was. Um, yeah. So I, I ultimately like needed to leave that, but that was like a, that was my five, six years between college pro and then what I'm doing now. Yeah. And what, what prompted or triggered friendly composting? So where <laughs> did that come from? Cause that's not a normal business yeah. plan or business idea. So knowing I needed to leave Earl's, I just like knew I needed to get out it was about January, February of 2020. So before the pandemic kind of was starting to hit, I knew I was kind of on my way out. So I started thinking about like letting myself think again, like, what do I want to do with my life? Like what would really get me back on track? Like it's not nonprofit necessarily. <laughs> it's not the restaurant industry and it's not painting, but I really loved so many pieces of the college pro experience. I really liked the sales process. I really liked spending hours choosing colors with clients. Like I liked connecting them to like what mattered about their home. I liked helping them make a decision about their home. So when I was thinking about getting back into a home service, I was like, that could really see myself enjoying helping people with their homes again. Um, that's when it kind of got the ball rolling. And for so many years at Earl's, I was kept being like, we have to figure out our organic waste solution like we're wasting so much food and I would bring it up at meetings and I was trying to connect with local farms as the manager there but I was so busy that it kind of kept it kind of kept just falling through the cracks yeah so I was for years at Earl's um bringing up the organic waste issue um just the fact that we were wasting so much food post-consumer waste and all of the prep all the veggie preppers, like everything that just like seems like such a no brainer that should be going to into an organic waste bin wasn't. So I'd bring it up at our meetings constantly, but because my role was so huge there and we were so busy all the time, I just like, couldn't be that person to take it on and get it rolling, even though I wanted to be. And that was what it kept coming back to for the owners and, and management just going, we don't have a person to take this on. Our head chef is slammed. Our preppers are already slammed. They don't want to bring on new habits or systems. So then when I knew I was transitioning out, I was like, I could be that person now. Like I could maybe focus in organic waste in some way. And then when I started thinking more about how I could make that into a home service, I brought it up to my roommate, Claire, and was like, do you think that this could be something that maybe could work as a home service? Like, what if we offered a pickup? What if we, you know, just did that every week and we like started getting this rolling? So I actually ended up Googling organics and compost cam loops just to see, you know, I was like, am I just not being a very like conscious minded consumer? Like maybe at home I should just start like composting my food scraps. Like I lived in an apartment, but I was like, I'm sure there's somewhere I could take it. I'm just like not putting enough effort into this. So Claire and I almost like super naively just like collected our food scraps for a week. We filled a bin and I drove them out to it's called cinnamon Ridge compost facility in Kamloops. And I get there and they basically go, we don't accept food waste. Like we're a yard waste collection. Like if you bring your leaves every spring or whatever, or every fall. And uh, so I just like turned around and called Claire and was like, they're not taking our food waste. Like we're, it's not, we're not the problem. Like there isn't a place in Kamloops that you can take your food waste to, even if you were motivated to do it. I ended up like pulling over on the side of the road, found this lovely woman in a community garden and was like, do you mind taking my food scraps? I've got this big bin of it. Like, and she's like, yeah, totally put it in my bin. 
Um, and I drove home and went, I think we can figure this out. Like, I bet you there's a lot of people in our community who feel the same way. And sure enough, there was a lot of people who felt the same way. Um, yeah. So like that, literally that, that next week we sat down with our computers and built a spreadsheet and started crunching the numbers on it. We started sourcing some repurposed bins. We found like a thousand bins on Craigslist that were old chocolate containers that we like hand scrubbed, hand stripped every label off. We drove down to Vancouver and back in like one panic day. Cause it was like during COVID we like didn't see anybody. We just drove right to this warehouse with this like random guy named Dave and packed our car up with repurposed bins. Drove back to Kamloops and then basically just voluntold our friends and family to like take a bin. And we told them we'd be back next week to pick it up. We didn't really even know like if we would. <laughs> um, yeah. And so we got connected with a, a farm. And as soon as we had the kind of green light on where we were going to process it all, we just checked it into community groups and Facebook groups. And when we can pick up your food waste and yeah. And in less than a year, we had over 500 homes um, subscribed to our service and we're sitting closer to about 700 now at about 18 months in. And um, yeah, so there was, there was a solution and a lot of people wanted to use it and we turned it into a home service somehow. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. What's been the, the most fun part of the journey so far? I think it's got to be the challenge of just figuring it out day to day and how we did grow super organically, just kind of like through word of mouth. Um, but it's been like just growing really steadily, really actually I'd say pretty fast. So there's just like always a bigger challenge on like the logistics of picking up all these bins every week, where we were going to clean them. Cause we offer a clean bin every week. So it's just been um, really fun to figure it out as we went and um yeah and how, and how big is your now, team now we have uh 13 13 people on our team now wow. so we have four four in full-time management and um nine part-time drivers that's yeah. great mm -hmm. um so the, the flip side of that question of what's been the most fun is like what's been the most challenging or stressful part of of this I think that probably the most stressful thing, um, oh man, I could honestly, it could be even the same answer. Um, so one of them, I guess one of the most stressful pieces of this is that early on, we, we did reach out to the city to find out if they were going to be offering an organics waste, um, service in the near future it hadn't landed on anyone's desk yet when we reached out and so we just kind of kept in the loop with them and they are rolling out now a program in in about two and a half years so it's always been front of mind for us that we've had to kind of like choose when and how to pivot the at least the residential program um but i would say a lot of the challenges happened kind of with financial constraints up front um with like lack of lack of funding up front, finding grants and, and sort of like that upfront cost, um, getting loans in place for equipment and, and just kind of like how, because we grew so fast, we like didn't have a whole lot of time to like build any sort of like credit or like anything like that. So it was really hard for us to kind of get loans right away, um, to invest in infrastructure up front. We kind of have slowly added things to, um, allow for us to take on more but it, the volume of food waste that we're taking on now is just like tenfold what it was at the beginning and it is heavy and um yeah I think if we had got secured some of that up front I think it would have been a lot more helpful to us than taking the grassroots approach mm -hmm. and what for you has been like so inside of 18 months this business started from zero and you're, you're at 13 people on your team, like 700 houses, like things are moving fast. Safe to say what's been yes. the challenging part for you personally in your role. Like what have you struggled with or like 
that inner game of business side of things? Um, what's been challenging and what's, um, what have you been working on? Yeah. So when we were growing as fast as we were, and we were starting to bring new people onto our team, I did struggle with, um, letting go of like my, how heavily involved I was with the day-to-day operations. It took me a lot to get to a point where I was working on the business and sitting back and kind of like planning bigger picture moves and pivots and things like that. I was just so consumed with the day to day and had it in my mind that I needed to be like doing the pickups every week. And, um, I would say that like in terms of the inner game, I had a hard time putting myself first and taking care of myself so that I could make really smart business decisions and put people in place where they needed to be. I just was like very consumed with the day-to-day of operations. Um, so it took me, it's taken me, it took me probably a full year to like really wrap my head around the fact that I needed to like bring on more people and and let go of being at every door every week and picking up just because for the first eight months, it was just me picking up all of the compost until Claire came on full time. And then we did it together. Um, so I did struggle with like delegating um, certain roles within the company and allowing myself to kind of like work on it and be planning what comes next and keeping, keeping the ball rolling. Um, and I got just very consumed in it. It was just like, I lived and breathed it. I woke up at seven o'clock in the morning to be at the farm to pick up, um, veggies. And then I would be working till 9 PM. Like it was just all day full on. Um, I didn't give myself a whole lot of time to, to rest. Yeah. And what, like, so what's helped in that being able to let go? Cause this is something that a lot of business owners and entrepreneurs get hung up on is they are the person and then that person needs to change. It's like who they are in the business and that identity with what you're doing. What's helped you through that process? Well, I would say this definitely going through this program and like learning about PQ. Um, when you first brought it up to me and we first sat and had our conversation about it, we were just starting to renovate an office space. We were so full in the thick of um, spring and summer collections and starting soil distribution. And I was so overwhelmed and consumed by just like, I couldn't take a second to like look, step back and look at what was going on. Cause I was just so consumed by it. Um, so this is, this honestly has been life-changing, like just going through this program and learning about PQ and learning about mental fitness. And even when it's not going like perfectly throughout my day, like I'm just, it's so it's there. Like I remind myself that it's there and it's a tool that I can be using. Um, I have, it has completely changed my life. Like it's completely changed the business. Um, and just, just for context, the program Katie's is referring to is the mental fitness training that I do with clients and positive intelligence specifically. Um, how, so it's, it's a more personal journey, like an inner learning journey about how you show up, how you self-sabotage, having more command over your mind and building your mental fitness so that you can um, execute at a higher level with your performance. So because it's a more individual focused um learning journey how have you seen it impact your business because that's that's a different kind of level to it and i'm curious to hear what you've noticed in your team or the business itself because of the work that you've been putting into yourself yeah um so just to give kind of like context i was just reaching kind of the one year mark um, of our business when I got into PQ and this kind of like personal journey. Um, we had, I was dealing with a lot of things personally and I was, and so I wasn't showing up every day, kind of like my truest self. Um, and I was not being a very like proactive or supportive leader. I was just going about kind of my normal routine for the week. I was just getting my normal things done. I was just checking boxes and I wasn't connecting with or, or really checking in with my team as much. Um, because I was just assuming that they were just going through their week, checking their boxes. And 
what really kind of like has been an improvement is that it's allowed me to slow down and, and actually try to understand what the feeling is in my company. And now at my weekly meetings, I kind of sit there and I listen a lot closer to what my team actually is saying and what they actually need. Um, and for so long, I, and I didn't notice this for so long. We were just on autopilot. All of us were just doing the same things every week and we're getting the same results. And there wasn't sort of any collaboration. We were just kind of all in our own little bubbles. And the second that I popped it and I went like, let's reconnect. Let's, let's set some goals. Let's do some more brainstorming. Let's come into the office. We were still, we had just renovated this awesome office space, but it was kind of just like a, office share sort of style thing where you'd come and sit at a desk if you needed to work. And so I went, you know, we've got this really great space. Let's, let's start doing our, our meetings in person. Um, And so there's just been this huge shift that's happened. And I know that I have been at the core of it. I can feel it. Like I'm showing up a lot truer um, as myself. I'm, I'm admitting my mistakes a lot more often for so long. I would just like, try to quickly fix something because I could, and I wouldn't like, like bring it up to my team because I was like embarrassed. Cause if I'm not getting it right. And what's the impact on your team when you are admitting publicly your mistakes? Like how has that impacted your team and what are you noticing in them because of that? I, well, they're, they're admitting it too. They're, they actually feel safe and vulnerable around me to admit when they need help or when they've messed something up and they want me to kind of like help them get through it. There's, there's such a level of vulnerability around or in our group now, um, just by me bringing it to the table and using that and being like my most, most authentic leader, um, And that is something I I just am coming to terms with. Like for a very long time, I didn't identify my, as my, as a leader. Like I thought that I was in sport and everything like that. But then I had been told long time ago that I showed up inconsistently. And for some reason I didn't own that. Like I didn't say to myself, it's okay to be inconsistent with how you show up as long as you acknowledge it and you admit it and you go, I'm having a tough day or like I have some things going on. That's why I'm not, you know, showing up the way I am today. And if you just admit it, then it gives everyone a chance to like get on that level and be real and just go like, I'm not feeling it today or I am, or like, I'm feeling creative. Someone give me something new. Like there's just like, if, if you just the, having these conversations now has just been like so inspiring. And it just started by me going like, guys, this is what I'm working on. I'm in this really cool course right now. I'm doing some personal development. I'm really acknowledging a lot about like who I've been to you and who I've been to myself and I need to start filling my cup. I'm a lot more um, selfish with my time. And when I tell my team that I'm off, I'm like, I'm off and they get it. And then I also encourage them to do the same thing. Like there's just like a total snowball effect of, of what this is doing for everybody. And I can feel it. It's like really awesome to like, to see them using some of the tools that even I'm sharing and taking breaks. And, you know, when I pause the meeting in the middle and I walk outside and just go, I just need to take five, everyone take five, like go eat something or get some fresh air and then we'll come back and we'll keep going. Um, yeah, it's just been, it's been really cool to see it shift. That's amazing. And it's so exciting for me, at, like <laughs> having worked with you to see that shift too, in terms of how you show up. Um, and I still remember one of the first times we chatted, like you were in full burnout mode in a very different space, showing up very differently on the call even. Um, and one of the things I'm curious about that you just shared is how you've been more selfish with your time and where you're spending it. What's like, so using some of the language from mental fitness, um, each of us has saboteurs or archetypes of how we self-sabotage our own success, uh, our own performance and our stress and like peace of mind. For you, which saboteur tends to show up and like, what have you been working on to put yourself first so that your cup is full for your team? And how is that, how has that shown up? Like, what was that process like to figure that out? 
Mm-hmm. So my top, my top one is pleaser, um, which was like at the beginning, I was so quick to say, Oh, duh. Yeah. I get that. I I'm just like, I'm such an empath. I feel for other people really hard, like too hard sometimes. Um, and I, and I do go above and beyond to make sure others are cared for before myself. I've done it for years. I, I identified really quick for that in that. And then the more we started talking about it as a saboteur and it being a negative thing, I went, Oh, wow. Okay. It's not, it's not about being empathetic or about giving. And I'm not this big, like, you know, mother Teresa giver sort of like it's a bad thing like it's a I need to address it it's not actually giving anyone something positive because I learned a lot about the way that it's actually causing you know distrust because I'm inconsistent or um so yeah so learning more about the way that my pleaser was holding me back and it actually wasn't allowing me to have authentic relationships with people um was very eye-opening because I I did see it as a positive for so long um And then connecting that to like the judge, which is another saboteur that everybody has. um, I started hearing the way that I was talking to myself when I was being a pleaser and that there was this sort of resentment towards people when I was giving and giving and giving and wasn't feeling like I wasn't getting the same back. It was causing resentment or I was expecting things back, even though I thought I wasn't. But I was. I was constantly disappointed that people weren't treating me the same way. Um, but I wasn't treating myself that way. So I was just like this eye-opening moment where I was like, if I'm not become being a pleaser to myself and putting myself first, then why, why should I expect other people to? And then so many of my relationships um, with my family, with my best friends, even that was the expectation of who I was to them. And so they didn't, they didn't notice anything different sort of in terms of like them having to do something back to me because I never asked for anything back for so many years. But then I could, I could see how there was like that buildup of that resentment and, and disappointment. So, um, yeah, I, I, it was that shift that happened where I was like, this is a bad thing. Like, these are not a good one. There's no good ones. <laughs> um, well, and, and something to, I want to distinguish is all of these archetypes. It's just like a simple way to make sense of how you show up and we're all a variation of them, but they're built off of subverted strengths. And what happens is, so for you, Katie, like pleaser, that's also one of my top saboteurs and it's built on a strength of being able to give and kindness and putting others first and, um, connect, like it's a very connecting type of person. Um, but it gets overused and abused. So you start doing that so much, but from a negative emotional place where it becomes this default habitual mode. And I know there's other business owners out there that do this and it's not so much um, that it's just a bad thing on its own. It's that it's been tainted. So you've been giving to your business or you've been giving to your employees so much that your cup is empty and it's so empty that you can't fill their cups back up as a proper leader. And that's why it's just such like a paradox of being a leader is there's this mentality of being selfless, of being a servant and giving and providing um, as a mode of leadership, which is a, an amazing trait for leaders, but it has to be done from a place of having your cup full enough to do that. And I think that's one of the things that I notice so many people struggle with is we're, that's our default mode where we just, we give and give and give, but then we get burnt out. And then we go through these cycles where it's just like this roller coaster where you give and give and give, and then you burn out and you flatline. And then you kind of crawl your way out of it. And then it just kind of keeps happening because it's this cycle that you haven't been able to break. Um, So true. And looking back, like retrospectively to my time in college pro or my time in uh, sports, wanting to be like a captain and things like that. Like I'd look back and go, I just, I wasn't being a leader because I wasn't showing up for myself or I wasn't setting ex- like high examples for, you know, a, a fitness routine or things like that. Like I wasn't leading by example in all those times. And with college pro, even I was so consumed with like making sure like my culture was good and my painters were making money and all stuff. And I made probably half of what all my painters made that summer. Like I didn't 
care enough about myself first in so many instances. Um, so it's really, it, I'm feeling it so much more in, in the culture I'm building with my company. It's way more authentic to like me because I'm showing them that I'm showing up for myself first and I'm putting up boundaries and I'm sticking to time off when I say I'm going to take time off. Like there's, there's a huge shift that's happening. (laughs) And I think it's so important. I just want to double down on what you said too, because often as leaders, I've noticed that we, we put the, the larger goal ahead of us and we'll tell our teams to be like, you need to take time off. I can see you getting burnt out, but we're not modeling it. Mm -hmm. And teams and people, we will follow what we see rather than what we hear. And it's something that I've really had to focus on for myself. Like even in my coaching is I can help a client with something and I can try and communicate an idea or kind of help advise them when they're looking for advice, but kind of coaching them. But if I'm not modeling that myself, um, it, it comes through and it comes through even in how I coach. So one of the things for me is when I'm not, um, so if my judge or saboteurs are at play and I'm, I'm feeling down and out, like I'm not, I'm not coaching well enough. Oh, like I said that question wrong. Like that didn't land. And like that kind of negative chatter starts to happen that energy shows up on the call and that gets communicated to, to that other person so that I'm not modeling it the same way. Um, so I'm curious, like, right. It's such a safe space in that program where you can admit that. And the fact that you admit that is really helpful for us sitting there going, Oh my God, these things are coming up for me right now. Like I'm having serious hijack moments where I'm just like feeling a lot of things at play and I need to, and my judge is coming through because you said something wrong. Like, the fact that you allow us to bring that up and kind of like mimic what the outside world could be like, if we actually were just honest when things are, are um, hijacking us or our saboteurs are coming up. Like it's, it's a very safe place to try those things out. I know that you say like, sometimes that comes up for you, but the fact that you say it allows us to kind of do the same. And it's something that's really been increasingly important for me is to normalize this stuff. Um, that's why I'm so passionate about coaching this and training people with mental fitness and, and going through all this stuff is it is a normal experience. We just don't talk about it. These are all things that like, I'm sure there's so many people that can connect with what you were sharing about how you were showing up as a leader and being burnt out and going through these cycles and just putting everything ahead of you, except for you. Um, and they, it, and so often like identify as like the workhorse, which I think probably a lot of entrepreneurs do. Like mm-hmm. you're like, oh, for example, you're the workhorse. You're the one who is putting in the most hours and you're like, you're moving this thing along. But, and like that's for so long, I was like, that's why I thought I needed to be so heavily involved in the operations every day. Like just dumping the bins and cleaning the bins and showing what kind of like pace I wanted everyone at. And like, I was the workhorse and like, and at the end of the day, like, if you put the right people in the right roles, they're going to be, they're going to work hard for you. You don't have to be the one showing them exactly like how to do it. And then it was just exhausting because I had all of those other responsibilities to make sure that the business was running, but I couldn't let go of that need to be seen as that workhorse. And I was really tired. (laughs) Like, yeah. Tired. (laughs) Yeah. And it's not sustainable. No. And I don't think I was having any sort of like, I wasn't present. So I don't even remember having very like sincere or meaningful conversations with my people because I was so tired and I was just working beside them instead of now when I'm like checking in on things or I'm like actually sitting down with, with our team, I'm going like, okay, I hear you and I can feel you and I'm present and I feel whole. Like I actually can vibe out a room and vibe out the, like what the, what the team needs um, versus just putting my head down. So th- this is a really cool thing that you're bringing up, which is around how you're listening, which is such a core fundamental skill in building a business and leadership. And I think it's a somewhat of a lost art. Um, often people are always talking about, oh, you need to be a better active listener. And, and I think it goes way beyond 
just the tactic of active listening. How does that show up for you and your team meetings? Like, what do you do before you go into a meeting? And how are, like, what, what are some of the strategies or things that you're doing and paying attention to, to really hone in on that and work with your team? Okay, so I would say, so just for context of this program, they make you, they make you, you get to work on your highest, most obvious saboteur for like a big chunk of it. So my pleaser got a lot of attention because I was working on kind of opening up and figuring out. And because I identified with it, it was like a very easy one to learn about in theory. Um, But what shows up for me day to day are two other ones. So there's hyperachiever and stickler that I battle with every day. And those are the ones that I'm now having to use, like my activate sort of um, practice on in the morning and go like, how is it, how are these things going to show up for me today? I have such high standards for myself. And that was why I had a hard time delegating because I wanted to make sure everyone like would uphold these same standards for me. So when I'm going into my day, I go like, I'm going to make sure today that I, when I feel those things coming up and I feel like my standards are too high for myself, I'm going to start admitting that so that my team doesn't feel like I have these huge standards for them because I don't, I don't have the same standards for them. I know that's like a bad thing to say, but like when they make a mistake or they bring a, a piece of work that they're really proud on to proud of to me for feedback, I'm super quick to identify what's great about it. And maybe I do offer some feedback but it still might not be where I want it to be. I just have a hard time like communicating that. So if I can stop myself in those tracks and go, okay, this is good enough. Like, let's move it forward. Let's get to the next stage. Let's let it go. Then my team can like start doing that. I just, I started to identify that as a problem because I think that they were really nervous to show me what they've been working on because I have very high standards for myself. And so now I'm like sitting and I listen to kind of like what they need from me in that moment. And like, I'm just a lot more aware that, that they see that, that they feel that from me. Um, Yeah. So, so what I'm hearing is like your need for perfection was more focused on the work that you were doing. Yeah. And um, the way other people saw you with yourself they were worried to bring you stuff. So it was almost feeding their perfectionistic tendencies and negative. There's a lot of negative emotions around like, Oh shit, is Katie, is this good enough for Katie? Because they can see you doing that with yourself where it's like, yeah. what Katie's doing isn't good enough for Katie. Yeah. Um, which is such a fascinating, like trickle down of how you show up as a leader and like leadership. Um, one of the other things that was coming to mind for me was um, like the impact this has on the productivity and the performance of your team when you actually do let go of standards, because I think as a business owner, there's always these standards of things need to be at a certain level um, because you need quality and you need to hold accountability. And on the other side, is the idea of done is better than perfect. And that you need to be, it's an iterative process. It's not one and done. Like you're constantly updating and changing these things that people are building. What's been the impact on your team and what they've been able to do without you because you've been working on yourself selfishly, which is kind of a weird concept to consider. (laughs) We are absolutely rolling right now. Like I, it, the juices are flowing. We're getting projects done. Like we, I, it has been tenfold, like different. We are absolutely rolling. (laughs) It's like the best feeling. We're being so much more collaborative. Everyone's kind of like identifying where their strengths are. We've shifted roles around. We've taken things off people's plates that they worked on for months because they're like, I don't, I'm not, this isn't me. I'm not, this isn't what I'm good at. Like, let's put it in this person's hands and like, or identifying um, new people to, to kind of move up and give more responsibility to Um, it's so much more collaborative that we're actually moving a lot more projects along 
Like we're actually taking things to the finish line. Whereas before we were just sitting on so many ideas just sit, and they would just come up every week, the same idea about this really cool coupon we should offer or this really cool bundle we should put together. And then we're like, so I finally just got to this point where I was like, yeah, like none of this, these are great ideas. You guys like, let's do it. Let's do some of these. Let's get them rolling. Who needs to do what? Let's just work on this one thing. Who wants to take on, let's like put this bundle together and who's going to do what? Let's get it done this week. Like it's just turning into this. I, I, we have such a great team and I, and now I'm kind of sitting here going like, I know that a big piece of that was because I had such high standards for myself or wanted to do something so perfectly the first time or not release anything till it was perfect. And now we're realizing how many times we can do something like we can keep, we can let it go and we can show our community and we can release lease a bundle and if it didn't work like who cares like it's we'll just do it better or we'll learn something from it there's so many opportunities and gifts and that's like a huge thing about this positive intelligence that's totally changed like the company dynamic because I've gone through it is like identifying what these gifts are and these opportunities by letting go of them and learning and like it's just it's really fun like we're all having a lot of fun again which is like how it all began when like Claire and I were tackling all those challenges and making tons of mistakes like we made so many mistakes at the beginning when we founded this and then we were having fun still and then at somewhere along the way when we were going through burnout and we were trying to you know be too professional like it was like let's just go back to the core of like what friendly composting is all about. Like it's this messy organics company that's super grassroots. It's a lot of really cool, like-minded, like environmentally focused people that are having a lot of fun diverting food waste and like solving a problem. So it's just like, we've gone back to that and it's just like so much more fun. <laughs> yeah. Just, yeah. And I can see it on your face too. Yeah. Like the first time we chatted, it was a very different look and energy. Um, and, and just for, for any listeners out there, I think what I want to try and pull apart from what you shared is early on, there's this spark that you have and there's this natural energy and momentum and it starts to get tainted with your survivor brain. Like you start to get more tired. So you start thinking more negatively and you start to motivate yourself through these self-sabotaging patterns that can actually create success. I think that's one of the traps is like your pleaser, how you, how you show up as a pleaser actually gets you a lot of things and it's gotten you really far in life. But as you're building a growing business, those limits or those ceilings of what's possible using those old strategies become apparent very, very quickly. Um, and that's when you start to hit burnout. That's when you start to have conflict with teams. That's when you start bringing things home. You start to kind of question your, your abilities and what's possible. And like, did you make even the right decision to go back into entrepreneurship? But that's what I see as a thread throughout a lot of the people that I work with is it starts somewhere and then it just starts to like fall apart. And it's because at the root level, you're just using a different part of your brain and motivating yourself through these negative strategies. And as you start to like address those mental patterns, you get to the root of it. And I think that's one of the things that I'd, I'd love for people to just sit with is it's one thing to hear Katie talk about this. And it's a lot of stuff that sounds so common sense of like, oh yeah, like let go and delegate things to your team and make sure you look after yourself. And like, it's all these things that we know intellectually and like conceptually, but it's so much harder to implement and embody because our mental patterns are not that way. And it, it's like going to the gym, you have to like put in a lot of time and effort to like create those new mental connections. So you're not, so you're actually doing it and being it rather than just talking about it or like understanding it conceptually. And to take that one step further, in terms of the delegating yes it's so simple to go i need to i need to sleep this afternoon like i'm i'm straight up tired you go do this versus like actually giving someone ownership over something and going i'm going to actually coach and support you to take this on for me indefinitely 
And whether you choose to coach and support the next person to take it on from you, I don't need to know. Like I want it just off me, but it needs to still be like, a, a you know, a productive, um, like role for the company. Like it still needs to be moved, but it's, there's just, it's different than just it, going and do this task for me. Like it's so much deeper than that. And if you don't have the capacity to actually admit that, like admit you need help with it and then know how to take it off of you, like mentally, physically, like not wear the weight of that task or role anymore. Like that's when you start to feel like energy again. <laughs> it's not like, it's not just this one simple task you need off, which I think a lot of entrepreneurs have a hard time. Like, admitting like you want to do it all but and you also like because you have those standards you want to do it right and like but it's so much more you have to have the the capacity to uh, neck like to coach and support that person in that new role too and if you're still burnt out and tired and trying to like catch up you're not going to be a very good support um for them yeah thank you for that distinction because often i hear like there's delegation where you can delegate something well and then there's like you abdicate where you're just like somebody else just does it. Like you just do it and you just like peace out and run away. Um, but w- even with delegating, I think you can do it from a saboteur way or you can do it from the sage perspective, which is a lot like a different energy and like you show up a lot differently in how you're delegating something. Um, and coaching, supporting all those things. If you're in deep survival mode and you're trying to just like get, something off your plate you can delegate it but is that actually landing well and the person that's receiving it are they actually receiving it in such a way that they can implement it well to the standard that you need and i think that's where we come back like it's all full circle it's like you need to have your cup full enough so that you can delegate in such a way that people receive it well um yeah and then i think on on that same topic is this concept of burnout or being busy we romanticize it so much as sort of like the norm like it's just like you will be burnt out at some point as an entrepreneur it's like well you don't have to be (laughs) yeah if you're you're not burnt out you're doing something wrong (laughs) or like I've been so conscious about what I choose to say to people lately in terms of like when they ask me how my day was or how my week is or what I've been up to I used to so much just be like I just I'm just busy I'm just who I am I'm busy and I'm always busy and now I'm just like it's not like, it's not something I should be proud of. Like, it's not, it's not actually something that's moving anything forward. It could mean a ton of different things. I, and so I actually very rarely, if ever tell people I'm busy, I don't feel busy anymore. Like I, and I mentioned this to you, I think last week on our call was just, I actually stood the other night, I was like curling and I was just standing on the ice and it's like such a, like a, like lovely activity. I don't have to think really. And I was thinking to myself, I cannot remember the last time I felt really stressed. And like, that was huge. Like I was just standing there so at peace going like, I don't feel stressed out. I don't feel busy. I don't feel like, and I got so much done today. Like my normal day that I would have probably identified as being busy doesn't feel like that anymore. I'm just like checking things off and feeling really productive. And then I, I finished my day and I'm like, I'm done for the day. And because I chose this role and I chose this life, that is what my day looks like. I have, for lack of a better term, busy days, but they don't, they're not hectic or like overwhelming. It's not something I'm like boasting about. Like, that's just the role I chose. I have a really like full day and it's like, I like moving through it. It's really satisfying. (laughs) And like, because I have energy now, I'm kind of sitting here going like, I don't feel stressed about it. I just, that's what my day looks like. And it's like, it's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. That just made my day to hear that, by the way. (laughs) Um, So we'll switch gears a little bit. Like, I mean, we've been talking a lot about like leadership and how you show up um, in a growing business. But um, what, what, like, what have you struggled with in your leadership? like previous to maybe doing the course, um, how did you think about it and what, what wasn't working? Well, right off, okay. What comes to mind right away is I, I didn't identify as a business woman or a leader in a sense or an entrepreneur, even like, I just like didn't identify as that because I felt so different than what I expected that mold to be. 
So for a long time, I just like didn't acknowledge that that was who I was. I didn't identify that way. Um, but I had, I've just had this sort of like awakening through this. We're kind of going like, I'm just am exactly me. And this is like what I'm really good at. And I really like, you know, putting a team together, building a culture. And this is who I am. Like as soon as I start owning my identity as just me and like whatever version of like entrepreneurship or business woman that I want to be is exactly who I'm supposed to be. It's not, there isn't a mold. And um, yeah, to kind of like get into that idea of like imposter syndrome, like those things come up. You doubt yourself a lot. Um, and I'm doubting myself a lot less lately, for sure. Like coming out of college pro, I, I just doubted myself so much. And there was a few times where I felt like a lot of like heartbreak over like not being noticed or being compared to my male counterparts who were, you know, maybe getting chosen over me for things and just overlooked. And I just like have come back to kind of like at the core of who I am and like how I want to run this company and not like waiting for anyone else's sort of like opinion or advice. Like I, I like to take advice and I'm not like saying I don't. Um, but at the end of the day, like I'm trying to really own what I feel and what my gut tells me in my decisions. And what, what's been working for you with that? Because I think in business um, so much, especially today, it's like rely on data, be analytical, make smart decisions consult people and that intuitive knowing it's almost like there's this mentality of it's, it's not to be trusted. Um, and it's something that I am so fascinated with. So I'd be curious to get your take on how you balance the two between making smart business decisions, but also leading from a place of intuition and, um, like a deeper sense of knowing. I think for a long time, I felt if I didn't, like I didn't go to business school, I didn't learn how to formally do finances or payroll or bookkeeping or anything like that. Like I've just really learned organically as I've gone through this process. And I felt very threatened by people who did know how to do those things. Um, it would make me feel very small. Like if I was going into a conversation or a web, like a call like this, and it, you know, I was on with people who were business experts so they say, I would make myself feel small. Like I would not be as confident outwardly telling them about my, my processes, or I wouldn't feel confident talking about my financials because I was so afraid that they would ask me a specific term that I'd like just didn't know. But I know my financials like, it, like inside and out, maybe I'm not the best, like building spreadsheets and putting that all together, but I know what my business, what my business is. Like, I know what things cost. I know what how much gas we're spending every week. Like, and a lot of it is intuitive. Um, but I really struggled showing up to those types of situations or sitting in on meetings like that because I felt small um, or inexperienced or uneducated around it. Um, and it's, and it was tough. Like I, I, I like being good at things. <laughs> I like knowing things. And it was really tough on my ego to sit in on conversations like that and, had terms fly over my head and I just like, didn't get it. Um, so going through this and having a little bit more inner dialogue, I sit with myself before I have to go into chats like that. Cause I know I'm going to, I know those feelings are still going to come up for me. I know I'm going to feel, you know, small or mute myself. So I, I sit with that for a moment and I go, you're like, you're meant to be here. I like, I, you did this. It's like, there's not really any other way of saying this like so own that like and own kind of like what you can bring to it and ask questions for things that you don't know um and then I've like been really fortunate to have like my co-founder Claire has a financial background like we have very um complementary strengths and so I do I do you know let her take on more of like a lead in those conversations which can be hard sometimes like when i feel like i'm you know i'm more head of people and operations and all of that and to kind of like give someone else the floor to talk about our business it was hard for me to like sit back again with my ego um but it's just as much hers right and she's so proud to tell people about the role that she plays in our with our financial projections and all these cool charts and graphs she builds and all of our cool spreadsheets like 
it's really sweet. And I'm trying to like get out of my own head with that and allow other people to kind of like feel empowered to take on those roles in our company. And I think it's been really important for me to like admit that I'm just not good at those things. (laughs) Like, and that's totally okay. Well, and I would, I would take it further and say it's a gift. I think that's something that, um, it's really hard to do as a business owner or an entrepreneur, or any, any kind of high performer. I always talk about entrepreneurs because that's the space that I'm in, but like there's probably a lot of like professionals that are just high performers as well. And there's this, for me anyways, I feel like I never know enough and I am always wanting to learn because I enjoy learning, but I do it in such a way that it's, saboteur driven in that like it's a negative motivation it's like i don't know enough i need to consume i need to learn more i need to learn more and it's not for the joy of learning quite the same way because at the heart of it is a bit of a fear of like i'm not good enough yet and what's helped me is to just flip that on its head and look at my weaknesses as my biggest gifts so for you to hear like oh yeah like i didn't go to business school i didn't take these courses Um, I know my finances, but I'm not like a finance whiz. It's like, what if we start considering those things to be our biggest gifts in our businesses? Because for me anyways, if everybody's thinking the same way, that's very dangerous in a business. And the other thing that I've noticed too is because I'm the same way, I'm not necessarily like a business um, graduate. I didn't go to business school I have good fundamentals and, but I ask questions that other people don't, or I, I ask the stupid questions and a lot of people are like, Oh, I actually don't really know. Or like, they give me some weird answer and I'm like, where is this coming from? And like, it really actually dumbs things down and I get a more simplistic answer or other people in the meeting are like, Oh shit, I didn't know that answer either. So like being playing that role and asking those simple questions can be such a huge gift for a business instead of looking at it like, oh, I don't know these things. This is bad. I might try. I should try and hide these weaknesses. Um, so some, something I just wanted to offer you, just hearing you talk about it. Yeah, yeah. And I'm also talking. Say- I'm also talking to myself as I'm sharing no, this I stuff like too. <laughs> so. I was gonna say that exactly. And I always just kind of like, and that's great about these types of calls, and we get to have these every week right now, which is awesome. But I always like kind of learn something or it makes me think a different way like when you were what came up for me when you were just saying that I was like you're right I do bring a lot of value to those conversations and I need to start thinking about the way that I bring value and how I what I'm contributing versus what I'm not like what I'm not understanding it's really easy to like be hard on yourself for what you don't know and it's a lot it's a lot harder to identify what you do and your strengths and like you said, what, what gifts there are and not knowing, yeah. asking the questions and being that person that just can kind of be honest. Cause I bet you there's more people in that conversation that don't like, sometimes don't even know what I'm talking about. Or like, I need to give, start giving myself a little bit more credit, which I've learned a lot through this course. Yeah. yeah. Well, and I think this is a great segue, which is one of the questions I'm always, I love asking, which yeah. is why is it so hard for entrepreneurs or owners to celebrate wins? And like, from your perspective, what, what has your journey been like and how, how has that maybe shifted over the last little bit to actually recognize a win, but which is different from celebrating. So I think often we'll be like, oh, that's a win. You kind of have a team thing where you like write the wins down, but to actually celebrate and embody that win rather than it being like a little checklist of like, we, yeah, we had a win done like like, what what shows up for you around this conversation and how has that changed maybe since college pro days so I would say I'm thinking back to college pro days and to heart and stroke days even Earl's like there's just this sense of like numbness around moving through that and everything that I did um or all the ways that I did climb ladders places like those should have been like exciting 
you know, wins. And like, I was really driven and all these sort of things. And I look back at it going, like, I just was going through the motions and I was totally in survival mode. I was just like, it's actually wild for me to sit back and start thinking about that again. Like I, I even like turned that off. Like I didn't even let myself think about college pro days. I had a hard time even admitting I like went through that program. There was like this weird chapter where I was like, didn't want to admit that's how I started my entrepreneurial journey. Like sometimes I would just say I owned a painting company and like, didn't, you know, it was like this weird inability for me to like, just admit things I had done and celebrate milestones or like I found my college pro little like awards thingy and it had my you know my lifetime sales on it I was like that was really cool like that I did that why didn't I ever really like sit with that like and feel it and there's like this shift that has happened where I'm really feeling deeply the good which for so long being like an empath I was always really feeling like the hard and heavy from people around me or myself and like I was stuck in that space for a really long time. So I think I had a hard time identifying when things were going well or I was having wins because I just like didn't allow myself to feel the good, Um, which I think like is a whole other story. But like, I think that's definitely like a trauma response. Like there's, there's so many things that have happened that maybe I just like, I'm starting to, to deal with and identify. Um, But for entrepreneurs, like you're right, there's a spark. And it's, you're just like keeping the ball rolling as hard as you can. You're having really fun, cool conversations. You're learning new skills. You're passionate about telling everyone about it. And then the really hard work starts and you forget to celebrate all the little things you're doing to move it forward or the new wins that are happening or you just, it's just like this pile driver of just like, and you're so consumed with your to-do list. And at the end of the day, when you don't get things done, I think there's a really like heaviness around like not feeling like you've accomplished enough. And so shifting that conversation um, and faith, you obviously are like awesome at reminding us of this, but like you're to done list. Like, what did you do? Like maybe try at the end of the day, writing down everything you did. And sometimes I, I sit there at the end of the day going like, I cannot believe how much I got done today. Like if I had a freaking GoPro on this whole day, like, that's what it is. <laughs> like crazy. And this is my normal day. And for someone who's not in this, if they watched that GoPro back, they'd probably be like, what the heck is this girl up to? Like, this is wild how much she's getting done. And yet I felt, I felt like I wasn't like showing up or I was disappointing. Like, you know, there's, it's really satisfying now to sit here and go, I'm just like feeling really proud. Like I'm feeling really proud of myself. I feel really proud of my team. I am like willing to admit and I'm proud to say things I've done and that I'm like, you know, with awards or like special recognitions or like things like that. I feel them so much deeper now because this is like my baby and it's like something that we've created and I'm really excited about it. And we, I missed it for a long time. Like there was a good six months there where I was burnt out where I was totally missing it. I won the, um, BC's business 30 under 30 and it I didn't tell anybody for about two weeks (laughs) like and my my man my warehouse manager found out and went why didn't you guys tell anyone like do you mind if I post this on our social media and I was like yeah okay sure I'll send you the photo and then I'm just sitting here going like that was really freaking cool and like I'm gonna be 30 next year so like I don't think that's ever gonna happen again (laughs) like and then I just glanced over it and like what a that's like so sad to not be present in your life and enjoy those huge moments. Cause I was so consumed with what I don't even remember what I was consumed with those two weeks. Like that's how fast this is moving. So like, it obviously wasn't that important that I couldn't have stopped and gone. That's really neat. Like, let me celebrate. Let me tell everyone about this. Yeah. So what, what would you share with other business owners, entrepreneurs, maybe you're a high performer at work, your head's been down, you're working really hard. Like, what would you want to share with them based on some of the stuff you've learned over the last 18 months? If there was one takeaway you'd want to leave them with. I'm feeling like I was at the back of a slingshot for a long time. And then I like released it finally. And I'm just like, I feel like everyone's got to go through this program. First of all, shameless plug. (laughs) 
but at the core of it, just like take the time to, whether that's figuring out what you're grateful for or identifying maybe some like things throughout your day that make you happy. I think there's like something to be said around pausing for a second and just like taking a look around and letting yourself feel very proud and like sit with that feeling and kind of go like, I did this, like identify with it. Like I did this or we did this, or like I allowed this space to be what it is. This is really cool. And like, I think there's this, we need to start feeling it a lot more (laughs) because it really does pass you by so fast. Like I can't believe we're almost in year two. And it, it is so true when you look back at like times when you were so stressed or you were, you're at your lowest or your highest or whatever, like you don't really remember them that much. And it, it's important to start remembering these things, like feel very present in day to day. It's, and it's possible too. Like I, I was really, really low when I was in my burnout. I like, I didn't even really know I was in it until I think you said it to me and you're like, yeah, I'm helping entrepreneurs with burnout. And I was like, oh, that's cool. I'm like living my dream life right now. Everything's chill and cool. And then I like got on in the second call with you and was like burst into tears and was like, I'm not okay at all. Like I don't this is like not normal to be feeling this way. I can't even string two things together and everything's the same. And yeah, it was, yeah. Having someone identify that and, and tell you that you're in it was what's important. Um, but then I had to really believe it and it's been a, a lot of work. Yeah. It has been. yeah. But I just feel very proud that I paused and went like, I need this for me, like take the business out of it. I'm going to like, this is going to be great for my relationships, for my family, for like everyone. If I just pause and, and do this. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that because I think that's something that is so underrated today. I I mean, the first one we talked about is the ability to listen. That really stood out for me for whatever reason, but two, creating space and silence. I think today, like there's so much information there's there's your phone your computer like everything's flying at you so fast and everybody's yeah the busy epidemic like there's just so much happening um and you have to be so intentional and disciplined to create that space not only like physically and detach from social media and your phone and like what what work is but mentally too because you might actually go on vacation you might take time off or you might have like an hour to go for a walk but you're just spinning in your head just like going through everything there's no mental silence like you don't actually slow down mentally like it almost speeds up in those times i think um when i first started with you you were doing you just said all you said to me was it's just 15 minutes out of your day like through the whole day you're going to take 15 minutes to just like be quiet and i was like that sounds really nice and then when i first started them i was just falling asleep do you remember that every time i was doing my pq sessions i was falling asleep for the first like probably two weeks i would lay i I kept laying down to do them because i felt like it was a meditation i'm a lot more intentional with with them now but i would just sleep and that's what my body needed and that's when i started to be like oh i'm I'm coming out of something really deep here. Like I'm exhausted. I can like, and this is exactly what I needed. It it was just like five minutes every two hours to sleep for like, and then I'd wake up, make myself up and, and, or I'd let it go. I'd sleep for an hour, but just acknowledging that and going like, that's how tired I was before. Just, just being like two minutes of quiet time put me like totally. (laughs) Yeah. Surprising how much that can do. Yeah. Um, so I want to ask two quick questions in a thunder round. So it's my version of a lightning round because it's not a true lightning round. Um, if you could have everyone in the world read one book or have one similar experience or, or thing that they do, what would you want them to do and why? This is going to seem really simple, but I want everyone to feel what it feels like to like feel their feet beneath them. This has been something that I've found just like in my like craziest of days. It's it's so simple when I'm just walking. It's just like feeling what it feels like to be grounded to the earth. 
I know it's simple, but like, it feels so nice to just like take a moment. And I know it's an example of a PQ rep, but for those who like aren't practiced in it or know what it is like that, just focusing on that physical sensation has been like huge for me. And it's made me feel a lot more like connected to earth. I know that my, my business is eco and all these things, but I still am running a business at the end of the day and there's a lot to it. So I think there's just like coming back to this, like something so simple like that. It's, it's grounding. Just, I want people to like experience what it actually feels like to feel your toes move on the earth, whether you're wearing shoes or barefoot or whatever, but it's like, it's just very, something very simple that I've found very grounding lately. Yeah. I think some of the the simplest things are often the most profound Mm -hmm. and are the hardest to do. And I, and I get a little triggered with the whole like reading a book thing. Cause I, I'm not a reader. Like I, and I want to be, I want to identify as like a reader and a learner and all these things that I'm not. And I get some triggered sometimes going like, I don't have anything to offer there. Like I don't, but I, that's just like something that I've, I've added to my day and become a habit of mine and a practice of mine. And I'm, I'm finding it very peaceful. Yeah, no, that's great. And in the journey of entrepreneurship, it's, it's a huge roller coaster. There's ups and downs, peaks and valleys, What's the most important thing that you need to hear over and over and over again that you need to remind yourself of over and over and over again through that journey? Be authentically yourself. That your journey is absolutely like no one else. You can read all the autobiographies or watch all the documentaries on startups. They're all going to go differently and everyone's going to have different life experiences. I have to remind myself like, constantly that what I'm doing and my authentic self and my truth is exactly what's going to get me to the dream life that I've always wanted. And that's why I'm in this to start with. Um, so yeah, just remind yourself of that. That's great. Um, and floor floor is yours. Like how, how can people find out more about friendly composting? Um, is there anything that you want to share around what you guys are up to if you're looking for help on certain things with your, your business or project. Like I want to open the floor up um, okay. to sh- so you can have a second to share. Okay. I love that. Um, so we're, we're at a kind of a major pivot milestone right now, which is super, super fun. Um, we're going through and launching a major rebranding, um, huge upgrades and investments in our, uh, our web design, our, um, we call it the composter um, operating system, our software. Um, we're looking into developing an app um, for our users to use. And this is going to be all kind of like really core infrastructure that we're going to use to expand. Um, so if people are in a community that don't have an organic solution that would like friend to see friendly there or a version of friendly, um, whether we choose to franchise or maybe we sell this software for Fife's compost and business to take off and wherever. Um, but that's kind of like our next goal is to connect more communities to accessible food waste solutions. Um, we are at friendlycomposting.ca. Uh, but like I said, we're making really big investments in our website right now. So it, I don't even think I've looked at it since the day we like put that website up, which is just so, so classic. Um, yeah. And we're at friendlycomposting.ca on Instagram and Facebook as well. Amazing. Thank you so much for coming. I had a ton of fun diving in. It's always a, a, a rich conversation and um, I'll chat soon. Yeah. Thank you so much for having me. I was yeah, I'm very grateful to be able to share my story. Absolutely. All right. Take care.